Today is May 11, 2018. I am interviewing Eric Rambush at Norwalk Community College in Norwalk, Connecticut. The interviewer is Caleb Pittman, working with Central Connecticut State University. Uh, for the record, could you please state your full name, city and state in which you live? Eric Henrik Peter Rambush. Uh, I live in Norwalk, the Row 8 section. Um, okay. Um, in which war did you serve? Served in Vietnam. What was your branch of service? Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. What was your highest rank? First Lieutenant. And in which general locations did you serve? Fort Belvoir, the whole, the whole time. Okay. Um, Other than basic training and individual training. Basic training was at Columbia, Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. And then I was at Fort McClellan for advanced infantry training. And then I was at OCS, Engineer OCS at Fort Belvoir. And then I was stationed to the Instructional Methods Division at Fort Belvoir, and I spent my entire tour of duty there. Okay. Um, so you said you were drafted, right? Yes. Um, do you recall where you were living at the time? Well, I was uh, halfway through my master's degree in MBA at Columbia. And I had taken some time off uh, and had worked for a company which was then known as Esso, which is now known as Exxon and Humble Oil. And I had two marketing traineeships in Sweden and Denmark. And I was on my way home to go back to Colombia and complete my MBA. And I got a uh, telegram uh, in Paris. I was staying at a lousy little third-class hotel known as the Grand Hotel of Luxembourg. Uh, it was near the Grand, but it was near the park known as Luxembourg. And my brother said, you're drafted. So that was the, the first that I knew of it. Mm -hmm. and, and immediately I began to say, what am I going to do? Um, and uh, long story short, uh, I have since learned I come from a military family. I would never have said that before. But I had a, a distant cousin who was in the Civil War, and my father had volunteered for the Camouflage Corps, which is part of the Corps of Engineers in the First World War. And I had two cousins in the Second World War. I had a brother who volunteered during the Korean War. My closest brother, my middle brother, was at that time an officer in, in the Coast Guard. So I have since learned from the Veterans Administration that that qualifies as a military family. Um, so yes, I thought of getting an affirmant and, and completing my master's degree. I never thought of dodging the draft. It was just a question of, do I go now? Do I go later? I got to go. And I said, go now. And so I submitted to the draft, and I went down to uh, the uh, draft uh, processing center, the inputting center, whatever it was called, down in the financial district. Uh, and if you've seen the movie Alice's Restaurant, it was the same induction center that Harlow Guthrie went to and he sat on the Group W bench, if you know the song. Uh, and, uh, and then I shipped out from uh, Pennsylvania Station, um, me and a couple hundred other guys, and uh, was on my way to Columbia, South Carolina, which of course was not the Columbia I had been planning on. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, I went through basic training in Columbia, South Carolina. Okay. Um, do you recall the date? Uh, I know it was late summer, early fall. Okay. 1966. Okay. 65, 66. I know. I think 66. They the war had just um, turned into being a, 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 a much greater war. Um, we were now sending uh, combat troops to Vietnam. Mm. Uh, we had been helping the Vietnamese fight their war, but that wasn't getting anywhere very fast. And we had been bombing in the north, but now we were getting more serious about bombing, and we were sending Marines and infantry troops uh, to to Vietnam. In fact, I can remember a specific uh, instance that's kind of a colorful uh, story. When I was in basic training, we were doing bayonet training, and you're out in a field in South Carolina in late summer, early fall going, rah, rah, rah. and, you know, everyone was kind of, had something else they wanted to do. 
and uh, the uh, company commander came driving down. Everyone could see him driving around the field, and he called the sergeants over. And then the sergeants called us over, and they said, Men, Red China has just sent troops into North Vietnam. We all went back on the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because all of a sudden, it was very serious. Uh, so that, it, it was a time of the build-up. Uh, so I think it was 66, 67. Okay. Um, and so you were drafted, so you didn't choose what branch you were in? No, I could. Um, okay. When I was uh, sitting in the tent at, uh, with a couple other guys at Fort Jackson, waiting to start basic training, uh, a recruiter came through, very good-looking, tall guy, you know. Uh, I'm, who wants to be an officer? Who wants to be a Marine? And, and I had always been told uh, by my college professors, particularly my economics professor, and that was my major in, in college, uh, that the best first job you could have was as a lieutenant in the Army or you know, whatever the equivalent ranks would be in the Navy, ensign, I guess, uh, because, you know, it's a big job and it's a lot of responsibility, but it's highly structured. So your chances of screwing it up are pretty slim. You're, you're going to learn how to get things done in an organization. And uh, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer for OCS. And he said, oh, well, then you have an option. Uh, if you volunteered to be a Marine, you had no option. But if you volunteered for Army, you had an option. And uh, yeah, I volunteered for the Corps of Engineers because that's what my dad had done in the First World War. That's what my brother had done during the Korean War. He was in the topographical corps within the Corps of Engineers. So it was kind of like, that's, that's where I belong. Okay. Um, can you tell me about your first days in service, like going to uh, boot camp? Well, my first day in boot camp, uh, I woke up on a train and it was, you know, all these tents outside and we filed out and uh, we, uh, you know, we all had a little uh, satchel for our clothes and we put our civilian clothes in, in that and an hour later we were in army fatigues and we had no hair. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then it was a certain amount of waiting. I can remember uh, waiting online to be fed. I can remember taking some, some uh, intelligence exams uh, and uh, it, you know it was just kind of the, 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 in, the army refers to it as in processing, mm -hmm. and when you leave, you're out processed. Uh, so it was in processing, and then when they had a group together, and they had the you you went a uh, uh, hundred of you would go up to wherever they do basic training. So my first day uh, was being processed. Well, my first two or three days were being processed and being interviewed by the by the recruiter. So I kind of knew I was going to what my path was going to be by the time I went up the hill to do some real soldiering. Um, I was going to go to OCS, um, and when I got to the uh, training company area, S Sergeant Varney was there. He was our sergeant all through basic training. Not a hell of a nice guy from from West Virginia with a smoky bear hat and he very quickly picked out the people who had been to college and the people who had some managerial experience and we all became squad leaders and the guy who had the most experience had run a uh, supermarket in Florida and so he knew how to put people on shifts and so forth so he became uh, the temporary company commander he got a band I had a band that said squad leader so I was in charge of 10, 15 men, and there were four squad leaders, and then there was a guy who was in charge of the, the company. And we started doing the things that go on in basic training. We learned how, we, we were assigned rifles, we learned how to clean them, and we were assigned uh, a bunk. I remember my first night in, in the barracks. It's interesting that you asked that. The first night in the barracks, there were two guys who had been on opposite gangs in Manhattan. It's kind of like the, the Sharks and the, what were they from West Point Story, uh, the Sharks and the, well anyway, one was Puerto Rican and one was white. 
and they had been on the opposite. They had been in, in gang wars mm -hmm. on opposite sides, and now they were sleeping, and they were great. <laughs> they got on <laughs> fine. You know, you're in the army, and it's a big mix, and I'm very glad I did it. I feel, I feel sorry for the guys who haven't been in the army, quite frankly, or the Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. It's a great mixing bowl. It's a great experience. It's an educational experience. Okay. Um, so how did it feel being there, um, like the first week being a boot camp? I felt like I was in camp. Okay. You know, they were just like the, the bunk beds that I had slept in at, in, at boys camp. Um, didn't feel strange. I, w I felt very comfortable, you know. I, I had been to summer camp, I had been to all-male schools, uh, uh, so, you know, to me it was, I didn't feel out of place. Okay. Um, do you remember your instructors? Well, the head, the uh, drill sergeant in charge of our company was Sergeant Varney. Okay. Uh, there, was, there was a sergeant there who did not like me. Uh, and he, he kind of thought I was an, he used the term educated fool because I was probably one of the best educated people. I was halfway through a master's degree. I'd been to Europe and lived abroad and could speak a little Danish and Swedish. So, you know, he was kind of like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, how did you ever get caught up in this mess? How are you ever going to get out of here alive? You know, you're an educated fool. Um, the challenge for me was not acceptance or, or personal comfort, quite frankly. Uh, I didn't mind being in that physical environment. Uh, but I was not as physically fit as uh, my compatriots. So, you know, when we had grenade throw, they said, throw it like a football. Well, I'd never played much football, so I wasn't, you know, that was meaningless to me. And uh, and then we had this thing called the alligator crawl, where you had to crawl on a map. And you had that. Fortunately, what I really got good at was what they call the monkey bars. Mm -hmm. and, and kids do them now in the playgrounds, but yeah. they didn't have so much of that when I was a kid. And once you learn to swing, I could go bananas. <laughs> and uh, one night I was out running track uh, around the parking lot, and uh, that same sergeant. Uh, who called me an educated fool. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to, you know, strengthen my running skills. He said, Rambush, you're good on the bars. Do what you're good at. <laughs> you know, play to your strength. And I had never forgotten that. Play to your strength. You know, if you've got to do five things, which one can you do best? That's the one you do first. Okay. Um, so was there anything particular that you did to get through that challenges? No. Now, I mean, my, my brother, uh, when, my eldest brother, when he was saying goodbye to me at, at, at Pennsylvania Station, he said, get with the program. Just get with the program, you know. And, and he didn't have to say that because, in a way, I had already made that decision. But nevertheless, that was the, that was the right th mantra to have in my head, you know. I wasn't fighting it. I remember there was a guy in the company who was, my, he was contacting his mother to write the state senator to get him out because he didn't like it there. I mean, just go through it. Get it done. Get with the program. Okay. So after boot camp, where did you go? Then I went to infantry training, uh, and that was at Fort McClellan, the home of the wax, in Alabama. And by, by now it was winter, because even in Alabama it snowed. Mm -hmm. And uh, our sergeant, I don't remember his name, but he was from the 1st uh, Cavalry, which were a helicopter. Uh, these were guys in Vietnam who were flown in and out by helicopter and had a big, beautiful yellow patch with a horse head on it. And uh, he said, is there anyone here who's been to college? You know, about four of us raised our hand. He said, good, you're the squad leaders. Uh, and off we went. And uh, the squad lead, these two of us had a private room. The, uh, I forget the other guy's name. He was from Brooklyn. We became very uh, close buddies. Uh, by that time, I was recontact. I recontacted uh, a girlfriend that I had dated in college, 
very nice girl who was going to end up becoming my wife. So I had her picture in my locker. And, and uh, again, it was, you know, learn what they've got to teach you, you know. There was one sergeant who was very mean, uh, who, you know, was the kind of guy who on Saturday morning wanted you to scrape the bathroom with a toothbrush or something so you could get out, go, leave. Um, you know, you, you got the people like that everywhere. But uh, basically, it was a, a, you know, you just did what they told you to do and do it as well as you could and, and uh, you know, move on. So just kind of more of the same of what you're More doing. the same, but more intense. Yeah. Uh, I can remember leave. We had some great, this, this roommate and I had some absolutely great times in Alliston, uh, which is, a, you know, southern town. So we didn't actually spend much time on the street. We just stayed in a hotel room drank and watched TV uh, and, and had quiet weekends and then went back and, and trained some more. Um, and then it was on to OCS. And it was funny, a lot of guys that I had trained with at, at Fort uh, uh, Jackson who had decided to be engineers, uh, they rejoined us. Half of us in my engineer company at, at Belvoir uh, had trained at Fort Leonard Wood, which was a uh, field training for Corps of Engineers, and half of us had trained in, in the infantry. My, I had an infantry uh, MOS, military occupational specialty at that time, as a rifleman. So half of us were trained as riflemen, and half of us were trained as, you know, uh, grunt engineers, and we came together at Fort Belvoir. Now, the, night I, the afternoon I left for Fort Belvoir, this girl that I mentioned to you, she helped me pack my duffel bag, you know, and, and it was very uh, tearful and, and emotional goodbye. Um, when I was got off the train or the plane or whatever it was that got me to, uh, to uh, Virginia, uh, I was picked up by two guys who were uh, ROTC, and they drove me to the parade ground at Officer Candidate School, and they told me, oh, they're going to kill you, and that the way to go was to have been ROTC, you know, that's what we are, you know, you're going to have to run in the dirt and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, by, by then I began, I was beginning to wonder, you know. So I found my company area, and I found the headquarters hut, and there was a sergeant there, Sergeant Jackson, black guy. And he said, what are you doing here, candidate? And I said, I just arrived. Uh, I'm assigned here for the next five, six months. He said, go up to the mess hall and have dinner. And, you know, I had heard all kinds of things about OCS and how tough, tough it was. And, and, and uh, I was going to be off balance the whole time. I probably wouldn't survive, da, 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 da. And that bit of kindness, go up and have dinner, just... Uh, in a way helped sustain me all the way through. And when I did graduate, um, and we were having a graduation dinner, I invited Sergeant Jackson and his wife to sit with my mom and dad, and that was our graduation parties. Okay. Um, so do you have any um, interesting stories or experiences from those two schools? Well, you know, the whole, uh, what happened, well, I had been warned about how tough this was. And uh, in, in at advanced individual training at Fort Jackson, at, at Fort uh, uh, McClellan, this sergeant said, why the heck are you doing that? And I said, well, well you know, do I want to be in a foxhole or do I want to be in a, in a job? And... Uh, so he said, oh, it's terrible, they're going to bing, bing, bing. He had been to OCS back in the early days of the war when they were looking for officers and they were staffing up quickly. And they took him because he was an experienced non-commissioned guy. And he thought it was a chance to, you know, leapfrog from the non-commissioned ranks to the commission ranks. And he failed. He, they squeezed him out. So he took a, 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 taught me something, again, that I didn't forget. He said, they are going to try to screw you up, you know, I'm going to be nice here for the <laughs> camera. Yeah. They're going to do everything they can to confuse you and to break you emotionally. Uh, it's called the fog of war. You, what you just have to remember that the 
tactical officer, that's called a, a training, advice, and counseling or something like that. The TAC officer is going to do everything he can to squeeze you out. So what you just have to remember what his job is and what he's trying to do. And so I had that filed away in, in my head as well. So that was very true. Uh, the TAC officer was a mean son of a bitch, or at least he acted that way, and the assistant TAC officer was much the same, and uh, they would do everything they could to screw you up. They would wake you up in the middle of the night, they would dump your trunk on the, on the floor for no reason at all, um, they would insult you, they would uh, do everything they could to cause people to drop out and say, this is not worth it, or I can't handle it, or, or whatever. And I just kept in the back of the mind, this is, this is their strategy, Eric. Just keep your head about you. They, we, have, we would have a chain of command. And we would be running to class. You ran everywhere. You ran to class and all of a sudden, boom! The company commander was shot. Next person take over. Boom! He's shot too. Next person. And you're saying, what was the chain of command today? So who is in charge now? Am I in charge now? Uh, and if you screwed up, they would insult you, you're not going to succeed, da 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 da. And uh, if you were building something, they would say, you don't know what you're doing. They, they never bothered you in class when we were learning how to lay out a minefield or build a bridge or build a building or, you know, land navigate or whatever the case may be. They never bothered you in class, but as soon as you were outside that classroom building, you were fair game. Um, so, for example, when we were land, we, we were doing a, uh, a course where you had to escape from the prison or you had to get through enemy territory to get to the other side. If you got caught, you went to the prisoner of war camp and guess who the inquisitors were? The tactical officers. <laughs> you know, and it would start all over again. You know, there was no escaping these guys. So, um, we, were, we had a peer review system at, at, at Fort Belvoir, or I think they do this at, at all the OCSs, Officer Candidate Schools, where the 100 people, or my, my company, we, we had two groups of 50, you peer ranked everybody in terms of how you thought of them as officer material. Oh, this guy was really, he was officer, and this guy, you didn't want to be near him, you know. And, and, you know, I never got any results until very close to um, graduation. And the tactical officer called me in and he said, Rambush, I'm very sorry to tell you um, you're at the bottom of the heap. Yeah, there's no one in your class who would want to be in combat with you. You just don't have the leadership skills. And, uh, but you're, you work hard. You're a nice guy. So I'm going to recycle you. This program is 26 weeks long. We're going to put you back in a 12 week. Some, because every, every week they were graduating a new group. So, you know, they had like 26 and coming down the production line. So we're going to put you back 12 weeks or so. And I just remembered what that sergeant told me about they're going to try to do everything they can to screw you up. So I said, I'm not interested. I said, in, in basic training, the company commander, after seeing me as a squad leader, said, you're officer material, I'm going to recommend you. In uh, advanced infantry training, the same thing happened. Um, so, you know, if, the, if it's not working now, if I shouldn't be here, then I wish to leave. He said, okay, you stay. So he was trying to take me out. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the things that we had to do along the way was, because um, lieutenants are responsible for training their men, as are the sergeants and, and, and et cetera, but the officer, you know, gets up on a platform as high as his table and, you know, the 50 guys in the companies, and he said, you know, this is what we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to go up this hill, here's the map, you know, and, or, 
this is a new weapon, you have to learn it. Or when they do physical training, you know, whoever's leading physical training is on this platform, about as high as this table, so everyone can see them. So, you know, they want officers who can project and know how to. So that was part of our training in OCS. Is we all had a, had a five minute presentation, a 15 minute, 15 minute presentation we had to do. And I had been on the debating team in high school and college, you know, everyone else was playing football and all this kind of stuff, and I was into debating. And I had done rather well at it. So when it was my turn in OCS to be on the table, and, and I, they were trying to screw me up, you know, and, and, and make me stammer and all those kind of things. And I had done very well. So my first assignment was as a trainer. So, you know, here's this tactical officer. You know, he must have been a good guy, you know, because he picked me out of the, the 50 people in the company to have this beautiful assignment. By then, Nancy Joe and I were engaged and we were going to get married. And I said, well, you know, for six months we can live in Washington while I do this because the usual assignment in those days was for for everybody to their first assignment was stateside to perfect their skills and then they went to Vietnam for a year and then they came back for six months and they shared, taught the next generation of people going over what they had learned in Vietnam and then they either left the army or if they were professional soldiers go back to Vietnam. So I figured I had six months of married life at Fort Belvoir and, and uh, my wife was a speech pathologist, is a speech pathologist and had worked at Bellevue Hospital. So when I first brought her on post uh, as an army wife, they uh, said to Nancy Jo, are you, are you dependent? Now they meant, are you an army dependent? Mm -hmm. you know, are you, you know, either you're in the army or you're dependent on somebody who's in the army. And she said, no sir. I'm quite independent, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we were off to a, to a good start. And another thing that happened, which showed my, my wife's attitude, she was not happy about me being in the Army, uh, but nevertheless, one day she, she was teaching at, or being a speech therapist at the three schools that were on, on post at, at Fort Belvoir, and she developed a flat tire. So she pulls into the gas station on the post, post exchange gas station at the PX. And she's standing on line, and this woman comes running in. The Colonel, the Colonel, the Colonel. So the, the specialist turns to Nancy Joe and he says, Ma'am, what rank is your husband? Because now he's in a kind of a tough situation. And Nancy Joe says, My husband is a lieutenant, but the tire is a general. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so uh, she, we found a beautiful place off post in, in Fairfax, uh, 77 Donnybrook Court, uh, and uh, Nancy had a job on post, and I had this job on post, which I loved. I absolutely loved it. I was being trained, and then I was training others, and then I got involved in actually developing training programs. At that time, the Corps of Engineers, was adopting something called uh, behavioral objectives. Every period of instruction was focusing on some physical skill or knowledge that you would need in the field. They, this was based on a systems analysis of what was called for in Vietnam. You didn't have to start a generator in subarctic conditions, but you might have to start a generator in three inches of swamp water. Okay, so they were taking, putting aside everything they had learned in the Second World War, which was magnificent, and everything they had learned in Korea, and how do we do it in the jungle? How do we do it in, a, in the Delta? And so all our training had to be modified, because we were not fighting on the plains of Europe, we were not fighting in the mountains of Korea, which all the older, more experienced trainers were graduates of those wars. We had a so, so I got involved in redesigning training in terms of specific behavioral objectives. And I even designed a course to train the permanent party, the people who are there year after year after year, 
uh, how to redesign their courses in terms of these behavioral objectives. So, I mean, I discovered my career in the Army um, because when I, when I, I ended up being all three, all my entire military career was at Fort Belvoir. They keep saying, stay, stay, stay. We got more for you to do. And you want to do more? Yeah, I'd be happy to do more. Stay. So Nancy Joe and I were living in Fairfax, Virginia for, for two years in a, in a community kind of environment with tennis courts and pools and everything. And uh, my brother, the guy who was going to be my brother-in-law was living at the one, one community over to the right and was getting, getting to know my sister-in-law. I had friends of mine in Georgetown. I mean, it was a great existence. And, uh, and when I left the Army, uh, I went back to Columbia. But one of the best decisions I made in my life is to go back and complete my MBA, and I went into human resources. And I worked for Denver Bradstreet, I worked for the New York Times, I was training people, recruiting people, developing people, uh, and, and then helping people with manage their careers, and then I ended up being an instructor here at Norwalk Community College. So that would not have happened, that, that career would not have evolved had it not been for getting assigned to the Instructional Methods Division in Fort Belvoir. So okay. I consider myself a very lucky person. Yeah. Um, so at Fel Fort Belvoir, um, what was a typical day like there for you there as an instructor? Well, I was, uh, other than the one time I had guard duty, I was, uh, you know, in, a, in an apartment with my wife, uh, with nice, three-room apartment or the balcony and a short walk from the pool. Uh, we would have breakfast. Uh, we would get in the car and we would drive to Fort Belvoir and I would get off at the instructional methods division and go inside and sit in a desk and she would spend the day going back and forth to the three schools and pick me up at five o'clock and we'd go home. So it's so, kind of like an average nine-to-five job? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was okay. great. Um, uh, you didn't sustain any injuries? No. Nope. Okay. No, I was very lucky that way. Okay. Um, do you have any interesting stories throughout your time there as an instructor, developing instructor? Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing I, I, I kind of alluded to earlier mm -hmm was uh, the, the Corps of Engineers, well, I, I, yeah, there was something. I, first of all, the, the most important thing was discovering the power of, of the whole technology of instructional objectives, behavioral objectives. I mean, here at the college, they're still wrestling with it, that every, every course should, what, are, what will the students at, at this college be able to do as a result of English 101, 102? And what will they be able to do all the way? And then if they take English 102, well, what are they going to learn and be able to do as a result of English 102 as opposed to English 101? And what are they going to learn in English 103? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, 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 the academics are having a very hard time figuring that out. Yeah. And particularly when you say, well, he went to Norwalk Community College and he took English 103, but this guy went to Southern. And he took English 103. Is our English 103 the same as what they did at community college? Right. And as you may or may not know, they, they, they wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. The academics wrestle with that. So they, they, in a way, the Army was ahead of the curve because they were getting very specific, not only about the course, but what was going on in every hour of the course. The other interesting thing, which I hadn't alluded to, was they were running out of people to draft. Because they didn't want to draft kids that were in college. I got drafted because I was had taken time off and I had gone to Europe and all the rest of it. So, you know, my two years of uh, deferment to get my master's degree had run out while I was abroad. So yeah. I was out there. I was exposed. I was fair game. But um, they didn't want to interrupt people who were in college. They didn't want to interrupt people who were in graduate school. Uh, they didn't want to interrupt people who were married. They didn't want to break up marriages. They didn't want to break up people who were, and they, 
So, so they were running out of people to draft. So McNamara came up with the idea, which on the surface is a, is a good idea. Why don't we lower the standard of the people that we bring into the army? Why, why does someone have to have a high school degree to be in the army, Air Force, Navy? Let's say that if they've had two years of high school, they're intelligent enough to be in the army. And we will train, well, they're illiterate. They're illiterate. We'll train them to read. What better, you know, uh, quite frankly, when, when you've got to be able to read, otherwise you don't get a pass. You have control over the students. You have a way of motivating students that the teachers in the public school doesn't have, mm -hmm. right? You know, don't have. So the Army took in 100,000 people that it wouldn't normally take in. And we got 10,000 of them in the Corps of Engineers. So we had to modify our programs or make special programs for these people to train them for jobs we thought we could train them for, such as setting up water purification plants okay, in the Delta, or uh, maintaining the smaller field generators that we had. And uh, in a way, I was very excited by that, because I thought I was doing some kind of civic good here. If you look at the results, as I have, on the net, uh, it was the only ones who actually had a career as a result of that training were the ones who stayed in the Army. Mm -hmm. The uh, kids that got all this special training and support when they left the Army were, you know, right back on the bottom of the heap mm -hmm. of the uneducable, you know, unemployable kind of people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's kind of sad, but it, uh, some people refer to this, uh, this these 100,000 people as McNamara's morons because they, they were struggling. They were struggling. Um, so it tells you something about what was going on in, in Vietnam. Uh, you know, the president was there to, uh, to build a great society. This had been a dream of President Johnson since he was a school teacher in Texas. And finally he had his chance to fulfill the dream of his mentor, FDR. And McNamara was doing everything statistically, and there, you know, there was no battle lines. There were no front lines and enemy lines. So he was, he was trying to prove that we killed more people than they had killed. And so everything was body count. Mm -hmm. and, and he came up with more draftable people. And, and, but it, it was a very, very sad war. The good news is, the good news is that we left and Vietnam was able to reunite, and we helped them in that process, and they now see us as friends. Yeah. That's, that's the good news. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we lost that war. The, the, you, but then again, as a historian, I have to put that in the context. The biggest challenge we faced in the 20th century was the defeat of communism. Mm -hmm. And we defeated communism. The USSR collapsed in 1991. So 1945 to 1995, the wall came down in 91, USSR collapsed four years later. So we won that war. Now you can say, well, there's Korea, there's Vietnam. You're right. But in, in the big war, which was defeat communism, Vietnam and Korea were battles. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we tied in, in, in Korea. It ended in a truce. 300,000 guys, 30,000 guys were killed. But, and we call it a war, but it, and we call Vietnam a war, which was a draw. But you put that in the context of what we were trying to do in the 20th century, and we did defeat communism. Yeah. And Russia is nowhere near the threat today that it was. 1950, 1960. I can remember practicing air raid drills and learning how to get under this table because the Russians were coming. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my service. I'm proud of what my country has done. Uh, what more can I tell you? Um, well, what did you think of the uh, your fellow officers and servicemen you were training? Oh, that's interesting. 
you know, what I, I, I have, I'm not even, I'm not prepared for that question. Uh, they were, uh, they were, there were two or three that I thought were smarter than me or as well as sophisticated or, you know, people that I would want to see after the service, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but they were all good guys. I mean, they were nice guys. There, 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 there weren't, uh, I didn't think of any of them as being uh, mean or, or uh, sickies. Um, you know, I didn't see them in combat. Um, maybe if I had seen some of them in combat, I would have had a, a, a different view on them. I mean, but uh, in, in the barracks context, they were nice guys. Uh, one of the funniest things we did, by the way, when we, we were at Fort, Fort Belvoir is we were, uh, couldn't, go, couldn't go home for Easter. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bury the Easter money. So we had a military funeral for, for the Easter Bunny, and we go all dressed up. And we got in our uniforms and we dug a grave and we did all the folded the flag and the whole thing. I mean, you know, you you uh, you invented ways of filling in what little free time you had. And God knows there wasn't much, but Easter was. Uh, we had a little more free time than normal, so that's yeah. how we filled it in. There were guys who had been part of drill teams in high school who obviously reveled in marching the men and were very, very good at it. And uh, there were a number of guys who were engineers, so th they volunteered to get into the Corps of Engineers. I remember a guy by the name of Dennis Lee who had uh, built parking garages all over the United States. So I think he was, he, he and his wife, uh, Charlotte uh, were sent off to Japan to build buildings. Uh, there was another guy who was uh, into conservation who was assigned to somewhere in Carolinas to protect the seashore. So uh, there was one guy who was a professional magician and an artist, a guy by the name of Hunter Gall. And so he had drawn Greek, you know, athletes throwing the discus and all that in the in the men's room. And the tactical officer loved it. He brought in all the other tactical officers and said, show them, you know, his laboratory. Look at this, with all this Greek art on the wall. So, you know, there were, there were a couple of guys like that who were kind of standouts who, uh, company I enjoyed, but uh, most of them were classmates. And, uh, and uh, we spent our time together and went our separate ways. I mean, if, if I were contacted uh, and uh, Company M was going to have a, a, a reunion, I would go. I would look forward to it. Okay, great. Um, did you keep a journal? No. No? No. Okay. Um, so where were you when your service ended? I was at Fort Belvoir. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I came across a regulation that said if, uh, because of when you were drafted and so forth, um, and, and the timing uh, of the situation, um, if you were to be let out three months early, you could uh, get a semester that you wouldn't otherwise have. In other words, we don't want to let you out in the middle of a semester and have you sitting doing nothing for two or three months. So I found this regulation. And um, I went to Dr. Gray and I said, according to this, I can get out in May as opposed to the middle of July. Mm -hmm. oh, you could tell <laughs> he, was, he thought I was cheating the system, but that, that was the regs. Yeah. And so Nancy and I went to Ocean City and took a little vacation on, on, the, on the Delaware shore or the Maryland shore. And then I was mustered out. Okay. Um, so what did you do in the uh, days and weeks afterwards after that? I went right back to school. I started at Columbia that June, um, and I started uh, talking to uh, Dr. Fred Way, who was in charge of uh, career counseling, and uh, figuring out what I was going to do next. Uh, I knew I was more interested in human resources. Uh, I started taking courses. Columbia does not have a, a degree, or at least it didn't then, in personnel management, human resource management, and so forth. So I kind of 
uh, put together some courses that related to that. Uh, I volunteered and took some courses at the School of Architecture. Uh, I for, uh, was a volunteer at the uh, Union Settlement House in, in, in Harlem, which, uh, you know, took advantage of my desire to be a counselor and train people. I was working for uh, the, um, the Settlement House had a contract with the Carpenters Union to train people to a furniture makers union to be uh, work over in Queens making furniture. And we were working with people who were then called unemployables. And uh, we actually had to go to their homes in Harlem and wake them up and you know, put them on a bus and feed them breakfast and deliver them to the factory by 8.30 in the morning mm -hmm. and in an attempt to instill new habits. I mean, these are the guys who ha if everyone in the United States, every male in the United States, everyone in the United States had to go through military training, these guys who had no work habits at all, it would have been the best thing in the world for them because they would have learned you get up in the morning, you work during the day, and you go to bed at night. Yeah. Uh, they had, you know, they went to bed when they were tired, they got up when they were rested. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of getting up because it was 7.30 and they had to be at the factory by 8.30 is just something that was not in their culture. And you and I were brought up in a, in a work-oriented culture. They were not. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they were unemployable. Yeah. It's not because they were stupid, not because they were lazy. It's just they weren't used to living on a schedule. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you join any uh, veteran organizations? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. I had no interest in uh, being uh, with the Foreign Legion or the American. Those were a bunch of old farts as far as I was concerned. I didn't get involved at all with veterans or veterans organizations. I had done my bit. I moved on. Um, until a few years ago here at the college, because uh, I, I, in the, my, my post-corporate career was working here at Norwalk Community College as an instructor, and we started saying, we've got to help veterans re-enter civilian society. And that is a challenge. That is a challenge. I had a couple cousins who didn't make it. Um, and so I kind of said, well, I'm a veteran. You know, can I, can I help mentor some people? Can I help counsel some people? And so I got involved in some programs here at NCC where we were helping. But, but no, I did not get involved. And I don't mean any disrespect to some of the other organizations, but I don't have the social needs that other people have to, you know, mm -hmm. go to the Legion and drink beer at night or, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in the Knights of Columbus. I'm, I'm not, a, I don't mean to sound elitist, but I just don't need those kind yeah. of social organizations. I've always been very, very involved and busy in my work. And, but where I had the opportunity here at NCC to work with veterans, absolutely. Okay. You know? Um, so, you talked about it a bit, um, but overall, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, in a way I've answered that question. I, I saw my, because my hobby is history, mm -hmm. uh, and in my post-corporate career I started teaching history, um, I saw what I did in, in the greater context of, of what the United States was trying to do from 1945 to 1995. We, the, the, the technical term for it is we were not going to fight communism, we were going to contain communism. Mm -hmm. And we were successful in, in that containment until communism, in, or the USSR, imploded. Mm -hmm. They could not sustain competition with the United States, and they imploded. And the wall in Berlin came tumbling down, and Gorbachev uh, shrunk the size of the, uh, of the USSR to what is now called the Russian Federation. So I, I put my military experience in, I see, I, I made some small little contribution to that overall effort. I also, I also liked being in a male society. I also liked the training. I hadn't been uh, 
you know, a four-letter man in college. I hadn't been a four-letter man in high school. I liked the physical training. Um, and I liked, I liked meeting the people that I met in the Army that I might otherwise not meet. And I honestly think it was good for me, and I think it was good for them, and I think it would... I believe in universal military service. Okay. I don't think we should have an ongoing war all the time, mm -hmm. but I think national service in some form or, or other is, is a good discipline. Yeah. It we are an integrate... We, the goal of this society is to be integrated. The military is a good way to make that integration happen. Mm -hmm. There is no society in our society, there is no community mm -hmm. in our society that is as well integrated as the military. You don't see skin color in the military. You see the rank of the person you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that's what America is all about, right? It's what you can do and what you can achieve and what you've done. Not the color of your skin that matters, sure. Or what country you come from. Yeah. Um, so, is there anything else you'd want to add that hasn't been covered yet? Well, in that last respect, uh, my son-in-law is uh, is in the military, and he had the experience of leading an infantry company where there were three languages spoken. Mm -hmm. So when he gave a command, he had to have people translate it into two other languages, and uh, unfortunately, he had two excellent grenadiers who did not speak English and who did not last. Uh, but I mean, that's 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 the army. That's the, that's that's what makes this place so exciting. Mm -hmm. And 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 the army really strives to, to integrate. So. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for your service and also for uh, taking the time to be interviewed today. My pleasure, sir.